Hello, and welcome to Local Leaders, the interview series with incredible local leaders sharing local insights. Today, I am so excited to be talking to Ralph Harper. He is the chairman and founder of the Night of the 2060s Project, which is an initiative derived from Ralph's book. His book is titled Own the Change, How Our Children Will Lead the Next Cultural Movement. Hi, Ralph. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Always. Always. So I'm doing great. Thank you, Ralph, for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about your book and your passion behind um, what you're doing. Yeah, my, my book is based on a premise that Black American people have been impacted by slavery. So the short version of this is that the book actually covers the continuum from the end of slavery in the 1860s. And then just you move forward exactly 100 years ago in the 1960s where voting rights and civil rights were achieved. But the lion's share of the book is really about a plan to guide, to appropriately guide our children from this point 50 years forward to the 2060s. And um, I know that the problems that we have in our community cannot be solved in a year or two years or three years, 10. And so that's why I just decided to give us 50 years. And the irony in that is that it lines up with the 60s. Black American people have always been impacted by the 60s. And it's just appropriate to, to lead now uh, going into the 2060s with a plan to kind of dictate the life outcomes of uh, Black American people. Wonderful explanation. And I, I hadn't realized the connection with the 60s. That's very profound. Yes, that was that was the thing that really drove me to to um, to take this on. Wonderful. Um, okay, Ralph. So, in light of the murder of George Floyd, the peaceful process, protest, and the worldwide attention these ad- events have drawn, would you mind sharing your perspective on the mass injustice that we're seeing it, that happened over a long time in the United States? Now, I have an opinion, and I talk about this, and I may, I may, I write about it a lot as well. I believe that the idea, the notion of inequality, has also derived from slavery and the end of slavery. And there's a large faction, or there are large factions of white American people who are, excuse the French, but they are hell-bent on ensuring that Black American people will never be equal to them. And it's really a weird kind of a dynamic because um, in some cases, there are really poor white folks who still believe in their minds that they are still better than Black American people. And so it's something that that has derived and it's, it's been perpetuated over all of these years, and um, and from my perspective, I'll be, be, be honest with you, I believe that, or I said a few minutes ago that Black American people have been impacted by slavery, but I also believe that there's the same faction of people uh, who are white who have been impacted by slavery as well, because I just believe that anyone who believes in their heart and in their mind and in their soul that they're better than someone else simply because of the color of their skin, for me, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And um, um, and uh, I, I know that this stuff has been going on for a long time. Um, the thing that happened with George Floyd is really such an unfortunate, unfortunate but powerful situation that has exploded around the world. And we just, we're in this place where we seriously have an opportunity to start seriously addressing um, the issues that exist in the United States related to the polarization of, uh, of our race in this country. Okay, so in your book, Own the Change, How Our Children Will Lead the Next Cultural Movement, one of the key points seems to be the seven principles of life that you have laid out which benefit everyone, regardless of race or social status. What are these and how did you come up with those? So these five principles are, I call them my 
when model. Because if you'll bear with me, Rebecca, I want to break this down a little bit. So I came up with these seven principles, and I grouped them into three buckets. The first bucket is workforce development, and it has three life principles associated with it, reading, education, and work. The next bucket has to do with integrity and has to do with uh, the accountability of our children and the choices they make and the respect for themselves and other people. And then the last one is the end, which has to do with the next generation. So those two life principles have to do with um, just duty in terms of teaching our kids the importance of doing and supporting other people within their own, but also this idea of saving money and being financially astute. So the, the acronym at the high level spells the word WIN, which is why I call it my WIN model. And then the rewards, um, like principles, it actually spells the word rewards, meaning education, work, accountability, respect, duty, and saving. But I came up with this because I honestly know in my heart that I lived my entire life by chance. And I say that despite the fact that I've had some pretty significant successes, I have managed multi-million dollar projects at PepsiCo, including at Frito-Lay as well. I started a company in 2000, and it was a staffing company, generated multi-million dollars in revenue and so on. But despite all of that, my entire life was left to chance. And when I say that, I say it because I know that rather than me being prepared proactively, I encountered opportunities to succeed and then kind of prepared myself on the clock. I don't believe any child in this country, I don't believe any child's life should be left to chance. We have an opportunity to be proactive and give them the answers up front and we fall short of doing that. So there's a single question that every, almost every single child in the world has asked, what do you want to be? Or what do you want to do when you grow up? And then we they go through that exercise, we ask the question, we receive the answer, and then we do absolutely nothing to little about supporting our kids appropriately to, in terms of guiding them to their future and, and to their dreams. So that's what the book is about taking on as many kids as we possibly can and instilling these life principles within them early, starting with a reading at age three and going forward from there. So can you just recap the, the acronyms again, the win and the rewards? Because that was very powerful. Yeah, so it's, the model is called the win. And basically what that says, this is what it takes to win in the United States. And then the seven rewards life principles, I was doing a speech and I told the group, at Yale University, and there aren't really a lot of alternatives to these these simple and basic fundamental um, life principles. There's no alternative to reading. There's no alternative to being educated in this country, and there's absolutely no alternative to working. And that's just an example. And um, it, again, it's so fundamental. And most of us know these things, but we don't take them as seriously as we should. Let me just say this because this is very important to me. The United States of America is the most prosperous and most powerful nation in the entire world. This is also a nation that is unforgiving of its citizens who are not prepared to be successful here. And it is especially harsh to black American people who are not prepared to be successful in this country. Wow. You're blowing me away, Ralph. I am really enjoying this. Thank you so much. I, I keep forgetting that I've got to ask another question because I'm so enraptured. <laughs> um, one of the major reasons you've created the 2060s project, I believe, is that today um, black Americans are still being impacted by slavery. Um, uh, sorry, by the norms of slavery. How are these norms, as you say, passed down? Yeah, you know, I, I tell a story, and I'll keep it short, but I was, I was seven years old. And I, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama in the 60s. And my childhood friend, eight years old, and we just went off and we spent the entire day just doing our thing. And we were gone for hours and we came back and I'm, I know our parents were like that they were looking for us. My parents, my mother was at work and, and, but we went to my friend's house 
And to make a long story short, we go inside, and I decide to delay my process of going home, but we go inside their house, and I witness my childhood friend. His mother told him to get in, a, in the position, and it was a familiar uh, um, order from his mother, and he immediately started bawling, he's crying, tears are flowing from his eyes like water from a faucet. She made him take his clothes off. She made him lie on across a coffee table in the living room with his knees stretching the floor and his arms hanging over on the other side. She took a few steps over to the living room that was adjacent to the, the, to, the, to the bedroom that was adjacent to the living room. And she grabbed a brown extension cord. And she used her left hand to wrap that brown extension cord around her right hand. And she came back and she reached back with all of her might and she whacked that boy on his back with that extension cord. And to this day, that experience haunts me. I ran home so fast and I, I remember turning the corner on that, that last corner to get to my house. And I felt solace. I felt solace in my heart knowing that what I would experience at my house because of my mischief would not be anything like I had witnessed at my friend's house. But that sound of that extension cord connecting with that boy's back, those instructions, the fact that she made them take his, his clothes off, that served as my foundational belief. That is a norm that has been passed down from slavery and it's not just as simple as that beating that child experienced. There are other things that are connected to this, including the fact that many Black American people aren't willing to admit it, but some of us are hopeless. We don't believe that certain things in this country that are available to other people are available to us. And by default, when you don't believe that, you're not willing to do the things necessary to propel yourself to a level of success. I believe that was my cool heart. Wow, that must have been such a turning point for you. Um, have you had other turning points in your life where you've really realized, wow, this is wrong and I need to do something about it? Yeah, I, I just all the time. I, 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 this is a really good question. I appreciate you asking me that because I was in Walmart. I'm going to tell a lot of these stories in my book. But I was in Walmart, and I live in Plano. Plano has probably one of the best school systems in the country. And I'm in Walmart, and this is a um, um, black American woman, and she's with her son. And her son asked her, says, can I have a candy bar? And she responded, yes, you can have a candy bar, but why are you sounding white? Why are you sounding white? And, and the thing that I took away from that is that any person with the audacity to deny their children the right to speak English in the United States of America, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And, and those are the kinds of things that kind of hold us back. And I know some people will say to me, hey, listen, you know, why do you have to air our dirty laundry? I'm just telling the truth. I'm telling the truth in a lot of ways and suggesting these are the things we have to resolve in order to mitigate any, any notion of inequality. Because when you're best in class, when you're best in class, that trumps, excuse that expression, but that trumps racism and discrimination and all these other things. It does. And I know that, and and I and we have so many so many examples, not just with me, but with so many other very successful Black American people in this country. And that's why I believe that these Black principles just they're not just for Black American people. Any underserved child in this country, I don't care what race they are, if they take on this challenge, they take on these life principles and they instill them within themselves. I can tell you right now, they will be very successful in this country. I am so excited to hear about your passion and your drive for this project, Ralph, because I know you're going to make it happen. It is just so wonderful to hear you talk about it um, in such a passionate way. Yeah, so this is something I'm, I'm very stoked about. And uh, I believe in my heart it will happen. We just have to 
do the kinds of things that will engender the right levels of support so that we can reach our children where they are. And in some cases, we may have to, I know we plan to mentor children, but there are a lot of parents in this country who really don't know and appreciate the things that they should be teaching their children. So we're open, open to mentoring parents as well. We will get this right. It's just going to take us some time to time to pull together the um, the forces that we need to make it happen on a national scale, you know, so that we can kick things off and uh, go forward. Well, mentoring parents is crucial. You're yeah. very um, okay. So my last question is: one of your cornerstones is providing children with the tools they need to succeed, in particular literacy. How would you contextualize what you call the dreadful norm of illiteracy in this country? I, I tell you, it's shocking to me. When I, when I decided to write this book, it was shocking to me to learn that 32 million adults in the United States are illiterate. Those are just the adults, 32 million. And I tell you, I have my own struggles that I've had and just growing up because again, no one gave me the answers. No one told me and I can't, I'm not being accusatory towards my mother. My mother, first of all, that I lived in a house, a four home house with my nine siblings and my two parents in Birmingham, Alabama. So I'm not, it would be irresponsible of me to, to, to do anything to be accusatory and point the finger at my mom. But what I will say is this, reading in this country is the foundational basis for learning. Learning is the basis for landing and, and, and mastering certain sort of skills that match key good paying jobs in the workforce. And then and we talked about this before, but working is so critical in this, in this country because if you don't do it, it obviously you, you will live a miserable life on minimum wage. Working just doesn't have to do with, um, uh, being educated doesn't necessarily just have to do with going and getting a college degree. If you become a master of IT security, but it takes reading. Reading is that starting place, and that's why I believe that our parents, every single parent should make sure that their child is reading starting at age three years old, because when that child is eight years old, they're reading because they want to read, not because they're being pressured to read by their parents. And when we solve that basic fundamental piece of education, that principle, that value, when we solve that early, I can tell you all of these other things will come together because reading provides you knowledge. Uh, when you read and you're a black American child, you'll know that Black American men represent 6% of the population in the United States. We represent over 37 to 38% of people incarcerated in the United States. And that's why this integrity is important because Black American people, Black American teenagers, Black American men are treated differently. But we need to know that. So we know that because we're gonna be treated differently, then we have to comport ourselves in ways that create situations for us to, us to survive um, certain predicaments, especially with uh, police officers and so on, and judges and so on. But reading is just fundamental. It is the basis for right. everything we do and achieve in this country, and we need to stop missing that point. Absolutely. Okay, well, before we wrap up, what's next, Ralph? What are the next steps that we need to take as a community, as an individual, to help you move this project forward? You know, first of all, I so appreciate having me here. And I know you and I have been before, and I just appreciate you guys um, for just having me here to have this discussion because I think one of the biggest things that we have to do is we have to create the bugs so that people can know to go to the 2060s project um, and they can sign up to support the project. They can make donations because we're at a place right now where we need to bring other advocates on board. We need to build a curriculum so that our work is being cons done consistently around the country. And the, the bigger picture thing that I'd like to do is to have a big data technology where we can track our children and track our results 
track their affinities, their graduation rates, um, the, um, their jobs, their level of achievement in corporate, so that we can have that data. We can make know that when we do this, we will start to fool by taking a snapshot of where we are today and then continuously taking those snapshots so that we can prove our programming and success with the 2060s project. And so that's where we are. We're looking for advocacy. We're looking for people going to come on board. We're looking for sponsors. Um, and, and by the way, this, this timing could not be more, I, I, no one could have anticipated COVID would happen. I wrote this book starting over, over three years ago. And here we are. A lot of the stuff that I've talked about already in the book is still happening today. It's still happening today. And, um, so it, the timing is perfect and um, it's time for us to pull together. And I'm not saying the time is perfect, it's time. The time is perfect for us to come together something like this. Because we do a great job commemorating our history, but this project is about the future of our children and I'm not suggesting no one else is doing that, but this project is specifically about getting our children to the future. And I know I'm talking too much because you know I talk too much. <laughs> okay, well, just to highlight to us, what's the website address and how can people get in contact with you directly? Okay, the, the website address is the 26th project is T-H-E, the numbers 2060s with an S at the end, um, project. Com. And okay. if you go to that site, you can leave us a message. And if someone wants to contact me directly, you can contact me at um, rh64 at ralphharper.com. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ralph. It has been such a pleasure to have you with us today. It's been my pleasure. You are such a blessing. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. It's good to see you and Philip again. And I uh, just want to say that. thanks so much. I, I tell you, I just appreciate the stuff you guys are doing across the board because you've done these kinds of things in terms of banquets and sponsorship of a number of different things that are happening. And I tell you, it's just impressive. And I'm, I'm so proud to see you come into this country and start to do the, the things that just make fundamental sense in changing our culture. Image. Well, thank you. We appreciate you too. And we've got to wrap up. So thank you for everyone watching. We so appreciate it. We'll be back next week, uh, Tuesday at 1130. Bye, everyone.